there are places in Greater Yellowstone where snow never melts. Or at least it never used to. These remote ice patches hide ancient artifacts, perfectly preserved for thousands of years. Now, our warming climate is exposing these fragile treasures, and soon they'll be lost forever. Once it's gone, it's gone. The longer it's melted out of an ice patch, the more it will be decayed. Every summer, more clues about the early people that lived here come to light, and the stakes get higher. It's a race against time to save our hidden history from the melting graves. Each time we get one step closer to the actual human being, we have an incrementally improved understanding of how attuned they were to their environment and their ability to engage with it. The native people really were everywhere on this landscape. They were at 10,000 feet over 10,000 years ago. When snow and ice accumulate at high elevations, they never completely melt, even during summer. They build up over thousands of years. Glaciers move. Uh, they are conveyor belts by definition, how they operate, and ice patches tend to be static features. Uh, they don't move, or if they do move, they don't move much. The artifacts remain close to the same spot where they landed. These are objects that were in the middle of their use life and then are left as a result of whatever actions were taking place. The animals and humans left traces of their presence that have remained perfectly preserved. Each is a rare window into the distant past. The things that are the objects of material culture represent a great deal of time, energy, and effort on the part of the person who manufactured it uh, or for whom they traded. And Yellowstone's ice patches reveal organic relics, including bighorn sheep skulls that are over 5,000 years old. Ice patch archaeologists are careful to respect the cultural significance of whatever lies beneath and to consult with the local tribal representatives. Well, archaeology is very important to preserving American Indian heritage because we need to continue to learn about our story. And we need to continue to tell our story in a way that is more truthful, that is more honest, uh, that is more human. We do not excavate at, at ice patches. Uh, the materials that come out of ice patches are all being released by what we generally refer to as, as atypical melting. Stone points and tools shed light on how early people hunted for food. We could look at this entire plateau and do things like say, look at where are every one of the obsidian artifacts and where did those obsidian artifacts come from? They came from volcanic rock that was quarried from the obsidian cliffs and some entered a trading network that extended from British Columbia to the Midwest. The most prized was Yellowstone obsidian, and that obsidian was also easily harvested and therefore easily tradable. And I believe archaeologists have placed it as one of the most traded objects in world history, and we find it on all four corners of the continent. At the highest altitudes in Greater Yellowstone, stone tools make up most of what scientists uncover. 90%, um, 95% of all the archaeology that we deal with is comprised of this inorganic element, and yet that only really likely represented about 5% uh, of the total culture of the folks that you might be interested in studying. Yellowstone's early people interacted with groups outside their homelands, and that also indicates a sophisticated culture. The greater Yellowstone area groups were more sophisticated than they're commonly portrayed. These people were masters at understanding the landscape, where to be at certain times of the year. They understood the movement of the animals. Oftentimes we consider people of the greater Yellowstone area to be nomadic. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, all of their 
movements were planned. More proof of this is found in the bones, hides, and remnants of early campsites emerging from the ice. The collection is representative of what's going on in the, in the greater Yellowstone. One bone even shows signs that an early American split it open to enjoy the marrow. The organic matter reveals details about the daily lives of Yellowstone's earliest people beyond their hunting skills. And so that's where these uniquely preservative environments like ice patches provide this uh, entree to understand uh, the past in a much more robust way. The wooden shafts, sinews, and woven pieces are of particular interest to Craig. The, the wood is not haphazard. You make very careful selection of the types of wood that you're using for your dart shafts, for your main shafts. You make careful selection on the types of uh, sinew that you would use for lashing, uh, the types of feathers that you would use for fletching. But beyond following their prey, why did early people travel to such high elevations? It's an escape from hotter temperatures down low, and we see that folks likely went to alpine environments to engage and, and provision not just for food subsistence, but I think also spiritual subsistence. Man. So this is, a, this is another one of these things where, again, you know, we don't have all the answers, and that's kind of the fun part of this work is that we have this opportunity to explore things that are not easily um, identified. Archaeologists and tribal representatives work together to preserve these pieces of prehistory before it's too late. I think that they went to the mountains 10,000 years ago for the same reasons that we go to the mountains. The ice patches reveal the ways humans used the high-altitude environments, beginning about 10,000 years ago. The folks had a complete and total understanding of how those environments operated, where they could expect animals to be present at certain times of year, but also reasonable source of water. Uh, all of these things uh, suggest that these are people that are very much in tune with their environment. For thousands of years, large mammals have migrated up to the ice patches during summer to escape heat and biting insects. Native people understood that animal movements like bison, elk, and deer were very much closely aligned to uh, the wind. And it's the wind that carries the smell of the grass. And it's the smell of that grass that causes those animals to move. Early people strategically followed their game into the high mountains. We've got numerous instances of bison in association with ice patches, uh, but the bighorn sheep have the most demonstrable evidence for having been hunted at those locations. Once an animal reached the ice, it was difficult for them to flee the hunters. When the hunters and their families returned to the flats, they left behind clues about their time near the ice. That could be a bark, like a cherry bark. This twisted leather, it's not uh, braided. It's maybe more uh, simply twisted. We've done ancient DNA on that, uh, that leather, and it's, uh, I was expecting it to be sheep, given the context, you know, high up in the alpine, but it turns out it's elk. Snow falls every year in these spots, and when the top layer melts during summer, it compresses the layers underneath. This results in snapshots into the past that span thousands of years. I believe there to be permafrost underneath ice patches. Ice patches can be quite thin, in some instances only a few meters deep, and they can contain uh, archaeological record that's 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 years old. Permafrost below the ice patches would assist preservation but it won't be much help if the surface ice melts. Yellowstone's ice patches also tell the climate story from 10,000 years ago through today. And now, the biggest thaw in recent history is releasing the long frozen items at an alarming rate. Few scientists specialize in ice patch archeology. span uh, I suspect you're probably looking at less than 25 folks worldwide that are really actively engaged in 
ice patch archaeology and actually doing field research. Ice patch research and recovery is very different from what we typically imagine archaeology to be. These are places that most of the year are in heavily snow-covered areas and consequently the window in which we have access to the materials is, is narrow. The window is only about two weeks per year and conditions are never predictable. Google Earth, with its high-resolution satellite image, has helped to refine survey locations. The scientists also fly aerial reconnaissance over 24,000 square miles, searching for ice patches that seem most likely to yield artifacts. We can grade those ice patches based on their potential. In the high mountains, the team searches for any ice patches that appear to be retreating, and then for anything sticking out of the surface. When something like this, right, so we had the real Dr. Sense Craig Lee recovered the, the oldest ice. intact there wooden artifact ever found in a Yellowstone ice patch, a birch dart shaft with personal markings near the tip. The tool even has ownership markings. This is a large instrument, probably around four feet long, and it was notched by the designer, by the maker, with three little marks. And the maker of this was able to imbue his power into the start, and also to allow others to know that this belonged to him. Radiocarbon dating showed it to be an astonishing 10,300 years old. All living things are actively incorporating radioactive carbon that is omnipresent throughout the atmosphere and throughout the biosphere into their system. Based on the amount of radiocarbon that is left uh, in an artifact, we can tell you how long that thing has ceased to be alive. The bench mark down there, yeah. So, but is this the scientists the must recover the artifacts first. But Earth's clock is ticking. The ice patches have shrunk by 50% over the last year alone. According to NOAA, every year our planet is getting warmer. Two places where the effects of global warming are clearly evident are Montana's Glacier Park and the Greater Yellowstone area. Higher temperatures in the alpine regions are problematic for wildlife and plants and disastrous for the organic ice patch artifacts. Glaciers maybe track a decadal average, whereas ice patches can really respond uh, in a given year. You, you really have to be there within the year in, in which that material melts out. This never-before-seen chapter in human history is in danger of being lost forever.